So we also need to talk about non-technical controls for securing data. And I have to warn you, this is not going to be the most spectacular video that you've seen from me. But here we go, right? We have to cover this. Now, we are technical people, all right? So we, we tend to address any technical problem like cybersecurity with a technical solution. Now, it makes a lot of sense to do so, but sometimes we just have to admit that there are other solutions out there that can improve our cyber safety. Okay, so or some things that we just have to do precisely to better implement our other technical solutions. So this is going to be about non-technical controls, right? Don't skip this because you have to know this for the exam. So when we're talking about non-technical controls, we mean actually data governance. Now, this means protecting data by having policies and procedures in place. Proper governance should be applied to the entire life cycle of the data. And the data life cycle kind of looks like this, right? It starts with the first step is understanding the classification of data. What type of data do we have in there and how sensitive it is, especially at the moment of data creation or collection, depending on where we get it from. Second, the next step is securing that data when it is stored. This includes proper access control, right? See the previous video about that. Against, you know, unauthorized access and also backups to protect us against uh, incidents and disasters. It also has to address the management of data when it is being disseminated or shared or distributed to other users. And finally, when the data is no longer needed, either proper retention has to apply or proper destruction of that data has to be ensured. So that is governance. And the first step is a very important one, classification. It takes into consideration the sensitivity of that data. How sensitive is that information that we're trying to protect? So keep in mind that classification must be applied to existing data as well as newly created data from now on. Because it's basically just a way of assigning some sort of a label or a, or a meta tag uh, to the data that specifies how secure it should be and how it should be treated, used or backed up or destroyed. So for information, data or intellectual property, you could use one of the following classifications. For example, public. I don't care if somebody discovers this. Private means that we own this data. So if you are not involved in any way with it, then you should not have access to it. You should not even know about it. A restricted means something like, you know, executive level eyes only, you know, information that pertains only to management. Confidential has to have a high impact on your company if it is disclosed. So basically, this is uh, the point where we start being really concerned about the data breach. <laughs> or also, uh, confidential information is going to suffer if that data becomes lost or changed or, you know, destroyed in some way. And usually the confidential information gets disseminated or shared only after signing a non-disclosure agreement. That's an NDA. And now another variant of this uh, for the sensitivity levels can be, used, can be uh, borrowed from the military world <laughs> saying that data that we don't care about, that's an unclassified. Uh, the classified information is supposed to be restricted with uh, private access. Uh, confidential information should be secured, but as a low security level, secret information, let's say medium security or something like that. And of course, top secrets, then, uh, you know, if I told you this, then I would have to shoot you. <laughs> and of course, this uh, classification has to be reviewed periodically for at least two reasons. One of them is that data might be changing jurisdictions, depending on the region and the laws that are applicable to that specific jurisdiction, different requirements might apply. And secondly, data might lose, actually it will lose, not might lose, it will lose its sensitivity over time. For example, the list of customers or the list of salaries in our company from 30 years ago might not be so top secret anymore. <laughs> data types refer to what type of information is stored in there and different controls depending on the data type and classification uh, are going to apply to this. Uh, this is because it's increasingly important when some of the data types have distinct and specific regulations that apply. And you know what I'm talking about. I'm covering here things like uh, personally identifiable information, uh, health information, financial data, and so on. Now, these types are usually built in or as much as possible built in into DLP solutions, data loss prevention solutions. For example, uh, Microsoft uh, 365 DLP solution covers more than 70 types of sensitive information and describes how each of them exactly is identified when scanning documents or any type of correspondence. 
And this page right here lists all these sensitive type of information definitions, how they are identified. You can see on the right hand menu here, we actually have a bunch of uh, types of uh, license numbers, uh, passport numbers, identity numbers, tax identification numbers for uh, most countries all over the world. So for example, uh, in my country right here, we have something that is called a uh, personal numerical code, right? That's uh, from Romania, CNP, right? This is the pattern right here. This is how it should look like. It does have a checksum, right, at the end of the number. And this is the uh, the code that enables this within the uh, the Microsoft policy to, to find this type of information within any type of documents or email messages that might be leaving your company. So you have all these types built in to most DLP solutions. You don't really have to define them manually one by one. One more thing here, these data types can cover even non-digital media. We're talking about cybersecurity, but don't forget that if you want to protect data, you will need to protect data written on paper as well. Data stored in cabinets, physical photos, magnetic tape recordings, and so on. So don't forget those are data as well. Ownership as part of governance is just as important as classification because it tells us who is responsible for a piece of information. Now, data ownership policies define a number of roles, starting with the data owner, kind of obvious, right? Now, the owner <laughs> owns the data, right? And uh, they're also responsible for the uh, CIA of the data, confidentiality, integrity, and availability of the data. So they're the ultimate authority about protecting and making that data available. They're also the ones that label the data and determine how sensitive it is. These are normally gonna be senior leaders. Those are gonna be the owners, the leaders of a company. Uh, but in big companies, owners might not be a person, even uh, the organization is a data owner in itself. So we have people appointed that represent the owners of the data, but the owner is the company as an entity. So with ownership, we have to focus on the role, not specifically on a, on a certain person. Now, the owner can also select a steward or a custodian to implement some of these responsibilities. Now, data stewards, they're focused on data quality. They're going to handle things like labeling and classification of the data. And even more important, they ensure that collection is done properly and storage is done according to requirements and regulations. For example, they're going to ensure that uh, data minimization is applied and that it's stored in the right format, right? We'll cover minimization in a few moments. And the second one we mentioned was data custodian. They're going to manage the systems that hold the data. So they're going to be responsible for enforcing access controls, backups, right? If we talk about digital data, uh, encryption, right? Anything that pertains to where the data is actually stored. And we also have privacy officers. Surprise, surprise, they're responsible for privacy <laughs> or ensuring that personal information, personally identifiable information, health information is handled in a legal manner. So there's a high responsibility because they can be sued along with the senior officers if a data breach happens. Now, legal requirements, of course, are going to depend first and foremost on the nature of data and secondly, where that data is located, where does it live? So data owners have to take care to properly follow these legal requirements. But in most cases, it's necessary to have some sort of a legal counsel. You might not know about all the regulations that apply to any specific geography. Legal regulations also affect data in transit, how it is stored, where it is stored for how long and many more. And they even cover situations in which you're trying to transfer data from one cloud region to another. You have to take into account the, uh, the possibility that that data is going to be transiting some cables that don't belong to approved countries or territories. So. Coming back here to the list of legal requirements that you might encounter, especially mentioned on the exam, we first have GDPR, that's the European Union's General Data Protection Regulations. This one says that personal data cannot be collected, stored, or processed without the person's consent. And also specifies that any data breaches that involve this information, if they happen, must be communicated to that affected individual and to the higher level authorities in less than 72 hours. So these regulations can go way beyond the traditional requirements of uh, encrypt your data and that's it. 
Uh, next up we have Sox, Sarbanes Oxley Act. Apologies if I mispronounce these. Uh, this is going to specify uh, requirements for storing documents about a company's finances and business operations. Uh, does not apply if your market value is below $75 million. So if you are cheap or poor. <laughs> <laughs> All right, PCI TSS is about uh, security controls for um, retail stores that process credit card transactions. So they're gonna, PCI DSS basically says what you should do, like you should secure the environment that processes credit card data, but not exactly how, right? So it gives you a lot of freedom. For example, it says that you're supposed to be performing periodically internal scans, external scans. Uh, quarterly or on major changes. You have to have qualified uh, personnel to deal with uh, IT security. You have to cover remediation as soon as possible and so on and so forth. You have to ensure encryption. You have to ensure uh, that data is encrypted when it's stored, when it's in transit and so on. GLBA, that's the Graham Leach Biley Act. This one addresses the protection of an individual's financial information when managed by financial institutions. FISMA, Federal Information Security Management Act, requires uh, organization, federal organizations to implement security controls, have monitoring and have a risk assessment process in place. A committee of sponsoring organizations of the Treadway Commission provides governance and guidance uh, against uh, fraud, you know, for finance, ethics and so on. Uh, HIPAA, Health Insurance Portability and Accountability, Act, of course, that's the last A, enforces uh, regulations about healthcare in the USA and focuses on protecting the medical files, the medical records, and generic health information of the patients. So just know about these, right, for the, for the exam, at least by their acronyms. Now, when it comes to processing personal data, since we talked about handling personal data, we also have some principles that address this, the processing part. And we start with purpose limitation. This again is related to classification and it means that data can only be used for certain things which are clearly specified beforehand and approved. So you have to make sure that you don't abuse that data in any other way. Uh, it's going to address access and usage. So for example, even if you do collect customer data, you're not allowed to conduct marketing campaigns on their email addresses without their explicit consent. Data minimization says that data must be stored and processed only if it's absolutely necessary and required for your business purposes. This means that you should not collect more than you need, <laughs> right? And uh, you also need to document with evidence why is each data point required. Now, the consequence of this is in a test environment where you are not allowed to provide to your testing teams or to your developers uh, real data if they have to use a user database, for example, because you cannot demonstrate that you need to use real data and not some mock data, right, so instead. Data sovereignty is about the jurisdictional requirements of the, uh, the region, of the country where the data is stored. Again, my advice is to rely on professional advice. <laughs> so, uh, because th there might be a lot of subtlety on this, it's better not to guess. Also, in some cases, different requirements might apply in uh, transit and you might not like them, especially if you're using cloud environments, as I said before, in multiple regions. So it might not be just about where those regions are, but also what countries is your data crossing when you're moving from one region to another. A retention, of course, is a big topic when it comes to regulations. And uh, we have to start with uh, the standards, retention standards. Now, uh, unfortunately, retention requirements or the threat of a fine is the number one reason why many organizations buy backup solutions and, <laughs> and appliances, unfortunately. Another reason is uh, for retention is the process of e-discovery. E-discovery or electronic discovery uh, is the process in which electronic data is located and secured with the intent of using it as evidence later on in a legal case in a court of law. Retention, of course, is covered by policies and procedures and, and they depend on the data's purpose. And it's uh, basically a formalization of how much data should be kept, uh, how it should be kept, for how long, even where, in cases where the, the backup of the data has to be stored at a minimum distance from the, <laughs> the master copy. Uh, and also what you have to do when you need to destroy the data. Now, short term speaking, on a short term, we can rely on things such as uh, versioning for files or daily backups, locally stored, 
But on long term, uh, this is going to be about data that might be moved periodically to archive storage, or so called sometimes cold storage, especially in cloud environments, which means it's not going to be so easily accessible, but it's there, right? Many organizations still use tape backups because they have huge capacity and they're really, really cheap, at least compared to hard drives and SSD, of course. Well, data sharing constitutes another problem here because when you share or outsource and you will have to share some data at some point with your customers, with your partners, some third parties as well. Well, when you share data, you're not also sharing the legal responsibility or the legal accountability for that data. You're still responsible for how the third party is going to handle your data because it's your data. Also, if the third party gets breached, you are the one that will suffer from the data breach because again, it's your data, it's not theirs, and it's also your reputation. <laughs> now, legally, you can protect yourself with signing agreements such as an SLA. Uh, this is one is usually signed between a service provider and a paying customer. And uh, it describes an agreed upon and expected and very importantly, measurable and measured <laughs> level of service. Now, this can include uh, requirements such as uh, what kind of availability should we expect from a specific service, how often we can expect downtime, for example, or maintenance windows, uh, security requirements for processing uh, requirements for confidential data. It should also describe how to recover in case of an incident, how to monitor the performance of that service. As I said, it has to be measurable and measured and what penalties should apply if the service proves to be outside the acceptable window acceptable service level. Uh, next one, we also have non-disclosure agreements. This one is strictly about data sharing. It's driven by context, it's context dependent, and says what are the legal consequences businesses or business partners that you're sharing the data with accidentally or intentionally discloses that information. Now, NDAs can also apply between a company and its employees, by the way, to protect intellectual property that the, the employees are working on or company secrets. MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, it's uh, not legally binding. So it's just a, uh, let's say, a gentleman's agreement version of a contract. But still, it should specify, at least after a something like a kickoff meeting, like the first interaction between a customer and, the, and a provider, at least we have a document like this that specifies what are the expectations from both sides regarding data protection in our case. We also have the ISAs, the Interconnection Security Agreements. This one is a type of agreement that applies to federal agencies that need to create a partnership with other companies privately owned, perhaps. And it describes how should the interconnection of their IT system to, should happen and how it should be governed. And finally, data sharing and use agreements. Now, these are going to address regulations such as GDPR or HIPAA that we just mentioned. And they're going to describe how data should be subject to things like anonymization or de-identification to minimize the risk of data breaches and data disclosure. One more thing here, don't confuse privacy with security and with governance, right? Because security actually means that data must be protected. You have to provide the adequate storage for it. You have to encrypt it. You have to uh, configure a uh, robust access control system and you have to ensure that it is protected in transit. So you have to apply some security controls, right? That's security. Now, privacy means it's just an aspect that we focus on. It's about putting policies, creating policies that ensure that the personal information is being uh, you know, shared, collected and used in an appropriate manner. Security is more focused on protecting data from malicious attacks and uh, exploits and data being stolen. And an idea here, a personal opinion, at least of mine, is that security is necessary for protecting data, but it's not always sufficient for also addressing the privacy requirements. And finally, the governance addresses any type of clear guidance about what can be done and what should be done and what will we do <laughs> about protecting information. All right, so that's it about non-technical controls. Now, I told you this is not gonna be the most spectacular topic out there, but not being a spectacular topic is not a good reason on the exam day. So make sure you understand what is governance, data classification, we talked about data types, 
Uh, make sure you understand the, the roles involved in data ownership, legal requirements, uh, the ideas that we mentioned when it comes to processing personal data, data retention, and when it comes to situations where you have to share the data with third parties. All right, so thank you so much for watching. Next time, we're going to talk about security policies and procedures. Uh, again, not a very awesome topic, but we'll get to the end. Don't forget to like and subscribe and see you next time. Bye bye.